there's now another modern FPGA-based Game Boy alternative available. This is the Chromatic by Mod Retro, and today we're going to dig in and take a look at how it works. Mod Retro's Chromatic is another attempt at creating a modern but faithful reproduction of the classic Nintendo Game Boy Color. But with a $200 price tag, it needs to offer a lot of value to compete with the other alternatives on the market. My Chromatic arrived in a very nice package, decorated with box art that takes me back to my younger years. Lifting the flap to open the box, you're greeted with a colorful mural that reminds you that there's a math quiz on Friday and that homework sucks. And aside from some good old fashioned long division, there's a sketch of the chromatic front and center, along with a QR code that takes you to the online quick start guide. And on the other side of the box here, we have the chromatic itself. I ordered the wave version, which comes in this light blue color scheme that reminds me of Rainbow Dash way more than I'd like to admit. The device itself feels very premium and is quite heavy, weighing in at 271 grams. In addition to the pack-in Tetris game already in the cartridge slot, there's all the standard Game Boy Color features that you'd expect. The clicky power switch, the link cable port, a headphone jack, and a volume wheel. The front-facing buttons feel really nice. We'll take a look at how these are constructed shortly, but you can definitely tell that some effort was put into these. They have a great amount of clickiness and the amount of travel feels perfect. One of the things that I've been hearing a lot about is the Chromatic's modern take on the Game Boy screen. Mod Retro made this custom display to be the exact resolution of the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color, 160 by 144 pixels. However, unlike the Game Boy screen, we have a bright, vibrant display encased in sapphire glass, which is a 9 out of 10 on the Mohs hardness scale, just one step below diamond. I have to say, if their goal was to create a modern display that feels just like an original Game Boy screen, they nailed it. But for me, the problem is the low resolution. By locking in at 160 by 144, there's just no hope of being able to run any other FPGA core on this device. Which is a real shame, because Mod Retro has open sourced the FPGA configuration and even provides instructions on how to build and flash a core onto the Chromatic over USB. And yes, you heard me right. The Chromatic's hardware design, firmware, and FPGA configuration are being released as open source. That said, at the time that I'm recording this, only the 3D models and FPGA files have been released. I reached out to Mod Retro to ask when the hardware designs would be available, and they told me that they're hoping to have those files opened up this month in January 2025. There's no doubt about it. This device has a super premium feel. Now, I like to put my handhelds on display. So whenever I get a new one, one of the first things I do is make a display stand for it. I couldn't find any online for the Chromatic already, so I fired up Fusion 360 and made my own. But a device this premium won't do in any old 3D printed plastic display stand. Oh no, it deserves something way more special. So I turned to my friends at PCBWay and used their resin printing service with a high gloss painted finish. And wow, take a look at the outcome. The ordering process was super easy. All you need to do is upload the STL of the 3D model and select the options you want. And if you don't want to fork over the cash for a premium finish, there are other less expensive options that still look great. If you want a high quality stand for your chromatic, I put a link to the 3D model in this video's description. Download it and consider placing an order with PCBWay to have one made. By supporting PCBWay, you're also supporting this channel, so thank you. 
and a special thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and supplying me with this beautiful print. All right, let's now take a look under the hood and see what the chromatic is running on. The back shell is held into place with four tri-wing screws along the outer edge. I'm personally not a fan of the tri-wings, but putting that aside, I love how easy it is to get into this device. Once you lift off the back shell, you'll notice that the battery tray is attached separately. Three more tri-wing screws hold it into place, and then you'll see that it's attached to the board here with a four pin connector, with pins labeled VBAT, VBAT underscore AA, TS, and ground. I have to admit that I'm a bit confused about this because it's rather odd that there are four wires coming off the battery tray. To try and understand this better, I took a closer look and noticed something surprising. Each of the batteries are wired individually instead of being wired in series. Since I don't have a schematic, I don't understand what exactly is going on here. But you'll notice that there's also two large pads on the PCB, which are accessible through a cavity in the battery tray. And one of these pads is labeled as five volts. Well, it turns out that this pad is connected to the VBAT pin on the battery tray header. So what I think is happening is that the chromatic is using the voltage levels on the VBAT and VBAT underscore AA pins to determine if there's a set of AA batteries or if there's a rechargeable battery pack. If that were the case, the labeling would make sense because the VBAT underscore AA pin would only have a signal if a AA battery was present in the top socket. Before we can remove the main board and take a look underneath, there's one more tiny screw holding it in place here at the bottom right corner. After popping off the display connector, we can remove the board and we'll find the button assembly underneath. I was impressed to see custom conductive membranes for all eight of the chromatics buttons. These membranes interface with the button pads on the PCB, which look to be finished in Enig. The plastic buttons themselves are also custom designed and Mod Retro has made the Parasolid models for both the buttons and membranes available for download from their website. The main board itself is a very high quality PCB. As I mentioned, it looks to have an Enig finish. This provides several advantages to a PCB, but it also isn't cheap. One of the first things that drew my attention on this board is this module here at the top. This is an ESP32 mini microcontroller. It has a 240 megahertz dual core processor, and it comes with built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. This little protrusion above it is the antenna, and it sits behind that plastic piece in the top of the shell. I wouldn't be surprised if Mod Retro was thinking about using this module for wireless capabilities at some point in the future. It'd be trivial for them to add functionality over a firmware update. So maybe at some point we'll see Bluetooth audio, or maybe even wireless multiplayer. Now, one other thing that's interesting about this is that the ESP32 Mini can also support serial peripherals. And looking at the upper left corner of the board, you'll find what looks to be a spot for a micro SD card module. Now, it's obviously unpopulated. So I asked Mod Retro what their plans were for this component. And they told me that they were using it for some internal debugging and testing during development, but they decided to leave the footprint on the board in case any modders could make use of it. And I happen to have a micro SD card slot that looked like it would fit. So you can probably guess what happened next. I soldered on the micro SD card slot and inserted a card. And sure enough, it not only fits on the board, but it also tucks away into the case without disturbing anything. Now, because the MCU firmware isn't available yet, there's not much more that we can do here, but I'll certainly be keeping an eye out for it. And when it drops, I'll look to see how much trouble it might be to pull cartridge ROMs off the micro SD card and load them into the FPGA core. Moving on, this larger chip here in the middle is an FPGA from GoWin. This particular chip is from their GW5A series, which is their fifth generation product line. Now, interestingly enough, Funny Playing's Game Boy Color, the FPGBC, also uses a GoWin FPGA. 
but they use one from Goen's second generation product line. I covered this in depth in my FPGBC analysis video, so go check that out if you want to know more. The Chromatics FPGA is a little more powerful with 23,040 lookup tables as compared to the 20,736 inside the FPGBC. But neither can hold a candle to the analog pocket whose FPGA has more than double the capability of both of those devices. Regardless, with the limited screen resolution on the Chromatic, you're probably not going to see anything other than Game Boy and Game Boy Color FPGA cores for it anyway. At least not for mobile use. Sitting next to the FPGA, we find a memory chip made by AP Memory with the part number APS6408L. This is a pseudo-static RAM chip with 64 megabytes of onboard memory. What's interesting is that the ESP32 platform can make use of an external PS RAM module to extend its memory capacity. I'm guessing that's probably what's happening here since the ESP32 only has 520 kilobytes of SRAM built in and this chip is right next to it. You'll also find several chips by Texas Instruments. First, there's a YF04E and a YF08E. These are both level shifters and they differ in the number of channels that they support, with the smaller one having four channels versus the eight channels of the larger chip. There's also a Texas Instruments LV245A, which is an octal latch. This looks like its traces are connecting to the FPGA directly, but without a schematic, I can't say for certain what it's doing. There's also another Goen chip nearby, a GoBridge GWU2X. This chip will convert USB to other peripheral signals such as SPI, I2C, or JTAG. And in this case, it's used as a JTAG bridge. These through holes here are labeled as JTAG pins and they connect directly to this chip. So if you wanted to develop your FPGA core, you could program and debug it through the USB-C port. Also connected to the USB-C port is a Genesis Logic GL850G. This chip is a USB 2.0 hub controller. The chip itself supports up to four downstream USB ports, and it looks like the Chromatic is only using two of those. The traces from one of the ports runs to the GWU2X JTAG bridge, but the traces for the other port disappear under the FPGA. To solve this mystery, I plugged the board into my computer and enumerated the USB devices. You can see that it does identify the GL850G USB hub, and it also shows that we have the JTAG bridge connected to it. But where's the second device? Well, if we turn on the power switch and then re-enumerate the device list, the second USB device now shows up, and it comes up as Chromatic Player One. So the Chromatic is presenting itself as a custom USB device. I poked around in the Verilog files and found out that this information is hard-coded into the FPGA core. So that other USB port does indeed connect to the FPGA directly. But what is this USB device? Well, if you plug the Chromatic into a Windows machine, you'll see Chromatic Player One come up as a camera. It turns out that it presents itself as a USB video class device. The UVC standard defines how video can be transmitted over USB, and it isn't something I've seen used for video output on a game system before. It's normally used for cameras. And for some reason, UVC on the Chromatic only works on Windows, and it doesn't include audio. Now, because this is all controlled through the FPGA, Mod Retro could certainly release a patch that addresses the Mac OS compatibility issue, or even change how video output over USB works entirely. But for now, if you want to use this feature, you'll have to stick with Windows. In the upper right of the main board, we have a 32 megabit WinBond flash chip with the model number W25Q32JV. This chip likely serves as the storage location for the Game Boy FPGA core. Now, one thing that's interesting here is that the Chromatic is actually using the Game Boy core from the Mr. Project. And aside from some necessary interface modules for the cartridge slot and the Chromatic specific hardware, 
I think they've pretty much left it intact. For audio, the Chromatic has a digital to analog converter from Texas Instruments called the TLV320 DAC 3100. This chip provides 24-bit audio and has a built-in amplifier for stereo headphones and a mono speaker. It's controllable through an I2C interface, which makes it a good choice for pairing it up with the Chromatic's ESP32 MCU. You'll find a custom house speaker paired up with this chip to supply mono audio through the device's bottom-facing speaker grill. I like the way the speaker's packaged. The housing protects it from debris, and the spring-loaded contacts eliminate the need for wires. However, I think the audio produced by the speaker sounds a little off. When you compare it to a real Game Boy Color, the Game Boy audio sounds just a bit fuller. I've been trying to pinpoint why it feels that way, and I think it's because the chromatic has too much clarity, probably because of that 24-bit DAC. It's almost like it's too crisp, but on an original Game Boy, I'd expect a little bit of a softer sound. Now, one thing that's noticeably missing from the chromatic is a display driver for that custom screen. I assumed that the FPGA was driving the display, but when I asked Mod Retro about it, they told me that the custom display has the video driver built into the screen itself. So the FPGA is only sending serial data to the screen, and the display is taking care of all the signaling. Overall though, I have to say that I'm very impressed with both the build quality of the Chromatic, as well as the engineering that went into it. There were some really clever decisions that went into the hardware design, and I love that it's all held together with just a few parts and no wires. It's as if the Chromatic was designed with the expectation that people would be looking under the hood. The materials used are all top-notch, from the sapphire glass LCD, to the metal housing, and all the way down to the PCB itself. I certainly appreciate this attention to quality and detail, but you are going to pay for it. Let's face it, $200 is a lot of money for this device especially when you can spend $20 more and buy an analog pocket with a 10x higher resolution screen, bigger FPGA, more buttons, more cores, and a rechargeable battery. All that said, there definitely is an audience for the Chromatic. I think the people most attracted to this device are those that are nostalgic for the Game Boy and want a high quality modern experience. Well, I hope this run-through of the Chromatic was interesting to you, and maybe even a little helpful. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and while you're there, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Alright, that's all I have for today, so I'll see you next time. But, as always, until then, go make something cool.